The Brooklyn Bridge abduction is an interesting case with government agents, the UN Secretary General and Linda. The abductee was not only abducted by a UFO, or in this case, a beam of light, but was also kidnapped in the interest of national security twice. What is going on with this particular case? I'm on a journey of discovery. I am seeking answers to some of the most challenging mysteries that face mankind, and many nuggets of knowledge and truth could bring those answers our unsolved cases and tales of the strange and unexplained. This show focuses on recounting cases and stories of unknown phenomena, mysterious events, weird places, and the unexpected. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts on this crazy case we're about to cover today. I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to get straight into it. So in the early hours of November 30th, 1989, something bizarre happened in Manhattan, as reported by UFO investigator Bud Hopkins. So Linda Cortile, or Cortile, now known as Linda Napolitano, which is her real name, but her previous last name, Cortile, was her alias name was a housewife living with her family on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and allegedly abducted by a UFO. According to the account, witnesses saw her levitating from her apartment window, going 12 stories up, by the way, and they noticed this illuminating UFO right above the building. And then it was then accompanied by three typical gray aliens. And that right there is just a, a showstopper. And that's it. That's really what happened. No, I'm just kidding. There's so many layers to this case. We have so much to cover. And I have some really great pictures for you as well. So not only do you have that bulk of the story of many people witnessing a woman levitating from her window into a craft, but there were some witnesses who, in a roundabout way, went on record in the sense of they mentioned it to Bud Hopkins, but they didn't really give out their real names and a few other tidbits. So among the witnesses, one of them was by the, goes by the name of Janet Kimball, and that's her alias name. And Hopkins uh, defined her as a retired woman. And driving back to upstate, you know, excuse me. New York after a late party, she was crossing the Brooklyn Bridge when she, along with other motorists, witnessed the rather unique scene. And they initially mistaken it for a film shoot, but then Kimmel and others quickly realized that, that, that this was no new sci-fi movie being filmed in Manhattan. And weirder yet, at least according to Janet here, people's cars stopped working as well for a short period of time. Let's think about this just for a moment. Have you ever casually walked across a studio set or when they're renting out a public area to film a movie? Now, maybe if you live in LA or in nearby Hollywood, maybe, but I think for your average person here, you won't casually walk in or see a movie scene i could be wrong i have never been that lucky to see anything like that but in this case to want to film at 3 a.m in the middle of manhattan in 1989 that's a pretty crazy thought in itself of you know what they must be filming a movie but then after when they began to realize that their cars weren't starting that ain't no movie and so here is a picture, an actual picture of Linda and Bud Hopkins as well. And we have to ask, how did this all start? How did this story come to light? What brought it here? And so it all started when Bud Hopkins received a letter from Linda and she wrote, she wrote to him after she had begun reading his book, Intruders. Really great book, by the way. And had remembered that 13 years earlier, she had detected a bump next to her nose. And it was examined by a physician who insisted that she had undergone nasal surgery. But Linda claimed that she never had such a surgery. And she even double checked with her mother who confirmed that impression of, no, Sweet Pea, you're absolutely right. You never had a nasal surgery. I don't know why this physician has given you this crazy information when it isn't true. But there's more to this. Because the case takes a turn, honestly, into the extraordinary 
with the involvement of three more witnesses. The first two is Dan and Richard. And that's probably their pseudo name, but they initially presented themselves as New York police officers. And these individuals claim to have seen the abduction from a vehicle parked under the FDR drive facing Linda's building. Funny enough, they actually turned around that story and said, no, we're actually security officers for an unnamed American agency and tasked with protecting a significant political figure but we're going to get back to that in just a second with Dan and Richard because their aspect of the story is honestly pretty insane. So this political figure that they were protect protecting is this man right here by the name of Javier Perez de Cuyar, and he was the then Secretary General of the United Nations. So the involvement of de Cuyar, who was purportedly witnessed, he witnessed the event, adds, in many respects, a layer of intrigue to the case because the idea that such a high-ranking official would be present at an alien abduction might seem far-fetched, but it raises the question, why would De Cuyar be any less likely to witness such an event than an ordinary individual? I think that is an absolutely valid question. Why can't it be one but not the other? If anything, he's a person to my understanding, okay? He just, maybe he was in the right place at the right time or the wrong place, depending on who you ask here. But this is a really important question that we have to ask ourselves. Plus, we hear so many times, so many, especially in this community, is truth is stranger than fiction. And this this story fits fits in that category. So further deepening the mystery, De Cuyar and his guards were also not alone. And the guards are, are referring to Dan and Richard. Because according to one of the agents, allegedly here, their company returning from the Governor's Island helicopter included two U.S. government officials and two foreign statesmen, along with their respective security details. Hopkins, however, did not reveal the identities of these additional witnesses, nor do we, the public, have a paper trail either. Which, with a lot of these cases, you could only get a handful of information. So with this and honestly, everything that we cover here, I will provide you all the information that I can. And then you can make up your own mind on if you think it is true or not. But either way, these are crazy cases. And this one, step, it's like in the top five. But now let's get back to Dan and Richard because there, there's a lot to them. So 15 months later, in February of 1991, Bud Hopkins casually went to his mailbox and he finds a letter. Now in this letter, it was signed by Dan and Richard. Now we have to ask, why is Bud getting a letter on this? First, he got one from Linda. Then he got one from Richard and Dan, and he's going to get another one a little bit later. But here, the letter stated that there were that they were police officers on an undercover assignment beneath the FDR drive in late November of 1989. And during that time when they were down there, they saw the alleged UFO sighting. Now, they claim to have witnessed, and this is crazy, they claim to have witnessed a large, bright object with a reddish-orange hue and green lights under its perimeter. And according to their account, they saw a woman and several unusual figures ascending from a high-rise apartment window into the In this case, they called it an object, but here we can assume they are referring to a UFO. But then... Okay, they changed their story to being local security guards for Javier Perez. And this is, and it just gets weirder from here because in the letter they said, no, we were just police officers for an undercover assignment. Then they say, oh no, actually we were security guards. 
But at this point, Bud Hopkins is so intrigued by this case because a lot of the things that was mentioned in the letter by Richard and Dan matches Linda's account. And these people, at least to our understanding, shouldn't know each other, right? So while Bud's getting invested, he's doing his research, he's one of the most famous and one of the best UFO researchers out there, even though he has passed for some time now, he has set a foundation for many other people to come forward as he was one of the very first pioneers in the UFO phenomenon. When he was looking into this, he ends up finding out that Dan and Richard and there's a very high chance, maybe like a 99.9% .9 chance, they were part of the CIA. So it's not looking good. No, because UFO phenomenon and the government do not mix. Like it does not make people happy. Now, does it actually mix? Yes, you cannot have one without the other. In the majority of cases that we cover or that we hear from time to time, you always have them paired up like bread and butter, like PB and J. All right. And for most people, we're like, why can't they be separated? That's a serious question. Why can't they? So this is when it's getting a little dicey because why is, or in this case, why was the CIA in into this case? Why, why did they reach out to Bud Hopkins and share their story? Why were they right under HDR drive watching Linda be abducted from her apartment building? Did they know what was going to happen prior? Or were they in the right place at the right time? Or is there more to this? There's seriously so many questions when it comes to UFO sightings, um, alien abductions as well, especially when you have a government aspect to it. Because so many people have completely different theories. And of course, I have to ask you, what's your theory on that before we go ahead and continue? Because it's serious. Now, Sad for Good says strawberries and ham. Is that like that, your combo, like PB&J? It's an interesting one. I haven't tried that. Mm -mm. Toothpaste and orange juice, says J. Allen Heineken. You know what? No, that is like devil's dessert or something. That sounds awful. <sighs> so with Dan and Richard and those, we don't know if those are their real names, nor do we have any photographic evidence that Bud Hopkins ever even received a letter from Dan and Richard, which is unfortunate, but let's continue with this. Because as the account goes, at least according to Linda, because Linda did extensive um, talks and interviews with Bud, along with she did speak at the MUFON Symposium in the early 1990s. And so she is recalling the account of how Dan and Richard, these people with an un unknown background, but we can assume are from the CIA here, were getting this obsessive interest in her. Now, it's never good to be obsessed with anything. It's usually very, very dangerous, especially if it's to a person. Yes, that causes harm and fear and stress, and you don't want to be there. So they engaged in activities that ranged from surveillance to outright kidnapping this woman. Okay? They kidnapped Linda not once, but twice, at least according to her. And it was driven by a mix of emotions, including fear for her safety, so they say, suspicion of her possibly being an alien, okay, and a sense of professional failure for not intervening during the abduction. Can we just dwell on that just for a moment? Just for a moment, please. If you are being abducted by an unknown entity, just entity it could be anything, anything that you're not aware of, right? How would you stop it? There, we have covered here, and you've probably looked at so many UFO cases, alien abductions, where those people can do absolutely nothing to get out of that. Okay, nine out of ten, maybe like nine point nine out of ten. It's 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 an all or nothing kind of deal. These people, whoever they may be, they couldn't have stopped it unless. They had a connection with those entities. Entities could be human or non-human. That one's up to you. That term is nice and vague, and that's why we can use it. But with this 
unhealthy attachment to Linda, they use Bud as a medium to get a hold of Linda. Listen to this. According to a critique of Bud Hopkins' case of the UFO abduction of Linda, excuse me, by Joseph S. Stafula, Richard Butler, and George P. Henson, that was written in 1993, they say, quote, Linda claimed that in April of 1991, she encountered Richard on the streets near her apartment. She was asked to get in the car that Dan was driving, but she refused, as you should, by the way. Richard picked her up with some struggle and forced her into the vehicle. Linda reported that she was driven around for three and a half hours, interrogated about the aliens, and asked whether she worked for the government. She also said that she was forced to remove her shoes so they could examine her feet to determine whether she was an ET alien, and they later claimed that aliens lack toes. It sounds like a foot fetish. Linda did remember another car being involved with the kidnapping and under hypnotic regression. She recalled the license plate number of that car as well as part of the number of the car in which she rode. Hopkins reports that the numbers have been traced to particular agencies and he gave no, no further details. And at the MUFON symposium, Linda was asked if she had reported the kidnapping to the police. This is a very serious question. And she said that she had not and went on to say that the kidnapping was legal because it had to do with national security. There's a lot, there's a lot of questions in that one paragraph. Again, that is coming from a critique of Bud Hopkins case of the UFO adoption, abduction of Linda. And first of all, I have never, okay, in the years of doing this, I have never heard of someone inspecting a person's feet, okay? It's like the ears, maybe the nasal cavity, sometimes the arms if you're able to see a protrusion outside of the skin which could be a probe, right? F a foot, I don't know, that one, that one's kind of weird. And this is like before foot finder, right? So it's just bizarre. But on top of that, this is a, a legitimate question that someone from the MUFON in, in symposium asked. And that was, did you report this to the police? And she said, no. Now this would make a lot of people live, but they're like, how could you not do this? Obviously it wasn't real because you didn't report to the police. And this is where it gets a little touchy, a little bit difficult, um, because in many cases, when things like this happen to your everyday person, they can report it to the police. They do report it to the police. And there isn't much done, especially if you are dealing with another alphabet agency, right? You're able to cover up the tracks, the paper trail and all of that. And so this is where it gets really difficult. And it's only for you to decide if you believe this aspect of the story or not, because it's not going to please everyone. OK, this is not a golden coin story that everyone loves. You're going to have very mixed feelings and very mixed reviews with how Linda handled this. But the situation escalated when Dan, losing his emotional stability, kidnapped Linda for a second time with an intention that bordered mm, impure thoughts only to be stopped by Richard. And then in a startling twist, both men claim to have been abducted alongside Linda. Can can we just take a moment, just take a little breather here, because the story is just getting more and more whack as we continue. So you have these officials. They're not policemen. They're not security guards. Are they the CIA? I have no idea. They abduct Linda twice. Okay, they interrogate her for three and a half hours. They make her take off her shoes and socks. And then they say, you know what? Well, in this case, Dan is infatuated with her. He wants to marry her at this point. And then they turn around and they say, you know what? We, we were also abducted during the same encounter. Are they using like 
some kind of like mental tricks going on here. Because when you're able to connect with someone or relate to a similar situation, yes, you are going to grow feelings because you think that they can relate with you. And in any relationship, you want to connect with someone and have them understand you, okay, all the time. So you can find that foundation, find that middle ground and say, oh, I've also been in that situation. Is this all just some type of psychological test, a psyop here with Linda? I have no idea, but that's a serious question here because my goodness, this is absolutely bizarre. And like I said, the story isn't for everyone. Is it completely true? Is it not? The research that I did for this, not all of it can be debunked, but this is coming pretty much from Linda. However, it is interesting that Bud received three different letters from three different people. And that adds in my in my book, a little bit of credibility here. But let's continue on with this. Yeah, moon at noon, bring in the jokes. You have toes, will you marry me? I mean, it's basic criteria right there, right? And Brian, thank you for that. And it went really well, thank you. Okay, so with all of this, they were also abducted and they were surveilling Linda this whole time, which which makes me a little bit confused here because you have in one letter written to Bud talking about them surveilling the building the night that it happened. And then they're turning around and saying, oh, we, but we were also abducted. Can you do both? Maybe, but I find it kind of bizarre, but there's more to this because according to Linda's regression hypnosis, she was referred to as the Lady of the Sands by these greys. And then they presented a dead fish uh, to them as a symbolic gesture. And this incident reportedly left a profound impact on Dan specifically to the extent that he like clung to the dead fish as a tangible link to the experience, which is really weird. But I do want to go a little bit more into depth on this regression hypnosis. And when we're dealing with hypnosis, hypnosis, <laughs> it's kind of difficult because you can work with certain people that will use words to entice your imagination more so than your memory. And then you're just taking yourself on a storytelling journey more so than something that actually happened. So regression hypnosists don't really have a good rap. They are prevalently used with abductees, like alien abductees. Um, and it's also something that isn't for everyone. But Linda, she did, she underwent hypnosis with Bud Hopkins. And during which she recalled being levitated from her apartment into a UFO. And in this hypnotic state, she reported seeing alien figures described as the classic greys next to her bed following the session. And she contacted Hopkins to share these newly recovered memories. One thing that I would really like to point out is that during this time when she had reached out to Bud, she reached out to him because she was reading the book Intruders. There are a handful of abduction cases in that book where the abductees mention Grays being out, like being right on the edge of their bed. I am not saying she got inspired by the book and, or, and then told her story to Bud. I am just putting it out there. And then you can make the connections if you like. But also under hypnosis, she recalled details matching those described by Richard and Dan as well, including, um, which is really crazy. There, she, she also mentioned, and that they mentioned, that there were a lot of similarities in their abductions. And also this like really weird aspect of an intimate relationship with Richard that purportedly spanned during their lifetimes existing only on board of the alien craft. That part, it, that, that one's really extreme for me at least. But hey, I'm going to provide you all the information. And <laughs> this one was kind of crazy, but <laughs> you can read that on your own time. So this next bit, what's cool about this is that 
when we are dealing with multiple witnesses and also at this man right here, looking at these high profile figures, we also have to bring in another person, in this case, an abductee by the name of Marilyn Kilmer, also in an alias name. And she claimed to have been abducted with Linda and Javier, this guy right here, as well as Linda's younger son, Johnny. So in that letter that Dan and Richard mentioned, uh, that they wrote to Bud, they said that, that they saw Linda being abducted and several other figures. Could it have been Javier, Marilyn, and Johnny here? Or could it have just been like, I don't know, maybe some cows, maybe like some, some ramen or something? Maybe all of the above. But at least here, both Marilyn and Linda, under separate circumstances, identified Javier here as being present during their abductions. And in that particular incident, Javier reportedly interacted with Johnny on the streets of Manhattan, Johnny being the youngest son of Linda, offering him an antique diver's helmet as a gift. And this helmet, which was out of place in the modest setting of Linda's home, was later identified by Johnny as being Javier's little keepsake once Johnny saw a picture of the then General Secretary of the UN, which is interesting. And so naturally, Hopkins dream, Hopkins dream was to be able to have Javier go to the public and acknowledge the facts of the abduction, as it would for anyone, right? Which would bring the case and the honestly, just like the entire alien abduction question to a sensational level of acceptance within the public's eye and the scientific community. But you know what happened? Take a, take a wild guess. Javier said, no, I'm not going to do that for some obvious public reasons. And so he went as far as to meet privately with Bud Hopkins to discuss details of his observations that night, but demanded that he remained anonymous. Now, when he was asked about his abductions, I think one of them was on PBS in the early 90s, he wholeheartedly denied it. He's like, nope, that didn't happen. That did nope, 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 that did not happen. And... We want to be a society where we can take people's word for it. You know, we want to believe what people have to say. But we're also very biased and it's a double-edged sword that will believe some people but not others and vice versa. And when do you believe them? When do you not? When do you know if they have an agenda? When do you not? When do you think they're going to try and save face and when they're not? Do you see what I'm saying here? It's a very convoluted. It's very difficult. And so in this case, let's let's just say for a moment that Javier de Coulart, Couillard did have an experience on November 30th, 1989. If you were in his shoes and maybe you were receiving a lot of funding from the UN, from government officials and who knows whatever else, and, and you want to save face, would you go out and say, yeah, I was totally abducted. And let me tell you, it was a wild ride. They would impeach you right there. I don't know how it works for the UN. Maybe like they'll just ask you to leave. But for the majority of people, you might say now, oh, yeah, I definitely would. But if you were in that situation, you probably wouldn't, especially in 1989. Now, in present day, in 2024, it's a different dynamic. More people are coming forward. It's getting a lot more serious than it ever has in the last 70, 80 years, which is fantastic. But I'm going to guess here, if and only if that really did happen to him, he was trying to save face and he told PBFs, no, it didn't happen. Because it would be a game changer if he said that it did. Don't you think? And if it if he did have that encounter and he did mention to the, it to the public, how do you think it would be taken? Do you think it would be scrubbed off the media? Do you think it would just sit there and age like fine wine? Or would he be completely ridiculed? Like what Fife Symington did for the Phoenix Lights back in the early 1990s. Hmm? 
serious questions I want to know in the live chat. I also want to know in the comments as well. Hyde says, will Bershad call him as a witness? Ooh, good question. Sandy says, in 1989, of course he wouldn't want to come forward. I agree. It was just it was a different time period. It was a good time period. The 80s and 90s, they were just great up until like the 2010s. Okay. That was just like a great time to be alive. Awesome stuff. But now, different story. Cindy says, I think family members would believe abductee stories of their relatives. Everyone else has a hard time with these stories. Lots of them do, though. <laughs> Yes. So I think that there would be a handful of families that would say, yeah, I believe you. But then you have ones that think that they're crazy. For instance, in most people's families, not everyone's, but usually if you have a decently big family, you have that one crazy aunt, that one crazy uncle, that one unhinged cousin, that if anything comes out of their mouth, you're like, I don't believe you. But then they have a, a higher likelihood of having a crazy story than your boring uncle and then fill in the blank, okay? You see what I'm saying here? There's still that level of perspective and perception as well. But I feel like for the most part, I would it would be nice for you to believe your relatives. But then you just you just have that handful, okay, that they're not the best. Okay, and I come from a very, very big family. And I can name my crazy uncle, crazy aunt, and my unhinged cousin. Oh, yeah. Tyler says, "I, why do I feel like I'm that uncle to my nephews? Hopefully, you're referring to yourself as the cool, crazy uncle and not the boring, bland uncle. Okay. <laughs> okay. And yes, if you're enjoying the show so far, please hit that like button right down below. We do so many great shows right here every single week, three to be exact. Okay, let me thank you. So in all of this, Hopkins is saying, can you please, please, please come forward? And Javier is saying, no, I can't do that. But we have to talk about the third aspect, the third letter that Bud got, because it seemed, at least in his mind, referring to Bud Hopkins, the case really seemed to solidify when he received a letter from a woman by the name of Janet Kimmel, who we, who we mentioned just a little bit earlier, and saying that while she was passing over the Brooklyn Bridge at 3 a.m. on November 30th, 1989, somehow all of the car lights and engines on the bridge just failed, including the street lights on the bridge as well. And she therefore got out of her car to see what was happening and saw, along with other drivers, a woman floating 12 stories high into a hovering UFO above her apartment building. So now you have letters from Linda, from Dan and Richard, and from Janet. Can I can I ask a question here? Am I allowed to? Hopefully, hopefully I am. And that here's my question. How do people know how to reach out to Bud and give him all these letters? And for any researcher of any kind, doesn't even matter what kind of researcher, just a researcher or a journalist, to receive a handful of letters or emails on a specific case is exponential. It's, it's amazing. It is like you have struck gold in the middle of nowhere, okay? And it's like tons and tons of gold, maybe oil, depending on your mindset. And so for Bud to receive three in a span of about 15 months, it's impressive. It really is. And so in this case, for Bud Hopkins, he's saying, dude, I got three. This case is getting serious. I'm not just getting one letter from someone that's unhinged. I am getting three separate letters from people that hopefully shouldn't know each other. Find, we find out that Linda and Dan and Richard know each other. But Janet is that outlier here, which just makes the case for many a little bit more serious than just those two letters, maybe just that one letter, okay? Numbers matter. Statistics matter. Cindy says, hooray for the crazy uncles. 
us. If you're listening to these kinds of shows, you are the crazy mom, dad, uncle, aunt, nephew, cousin, whatever. You are that crazy one. And you know what? You're like a thousand times cooler, by the way. <laughs> yes. Okay, but there's a little bit more to this. And unfortunately, with this particular aspect, we don't have the x-ray. So right here, I'm just showing a visual aid. Okay, just remember that. Because in November of 1991, a doctor who Hopkins described as closely connected with Linda took an x-ray of Linda's head because she knew about the story of the nasal implants and because Linda frequently spoke of the problem with her nose that she had mentioned had happened like 13 years prior. And that's why she reached out to Bud after reading the book Intruders and mentioning that just something in her nose is really bizarre. So she gets an x-ray in 1991. We do not have the photographs of that. Bud did not make that information public, which is devastating. But at least as the story goes here, it says that the doctor was very nervous and unwilling to discuss the x-rays that were taken of her. It took a few days to develop. And so Linda took it to Hopkins, who showed it to a neurosurgeon friend of his. And the neurosurgeon was astonished because there was a sizable, clearly non-natural object could be seen in the nasal cavity. And Hopkins uh, also showed like a slide of the x-ray during his presentation at the MUFON symposium, but I couldn't find it. And the implant is strikingly apparent even to a lay audience, referring to like your average people that don't have a medical background. And the object was a shaft approximately a quarter inch long with a curly Q wire structure on each end. We've heard of this detail before. There are a handful of strange objects, usually in the nasal cavity more so than like other parts. Sometimes like in the heel, I think in the heel of the foot as well, where you have these tube-like objects that have two curly cues or kind of curls on each side, maybe to stick it in place. Who knows? But we're also seeing it here with Linda's case. But the stakes are, are really high with this case in many respects. Who do we believe? Do we believe anyone here? Should we believe all of them or none of them? And of course, of course, we need to consider, is this case, this entire case, just a hoax? But we got to ask, why would it be or why would it not be? Is this all just to fill in the disinformation campaign? Is that why allegedly the CIA got involved? Because we don't actually know who Dan and Richard are. We have no information. We only have that letter and Linda's interaction with them. But let's say that is the case. Get it? Case because we're covering a case here. It's disappointing, but this entire topic, the entire UFO phenomenon is riddled with misinformation and disinformation, and it's creating those different camps, those the believers and non-believers believing certain cases, but not others, those that want the fame, those that want to make the extra money writing a book, those that just need a little bit of attention because they're not getting it at home. There are so many aspects to this, and that's where it gets very difficult. Who do we know? when and what to believe and when not to and who gets to decide that which is even like crazier because some people that have these credentials say nope that's not true and then they have their cult that follow them and say you know what this person said it's not true so it must not be even if they do not provide the sufficient evidence to display as to why they do not believe the case to be true or the data do you see what i'm saying here and the same for the the other camp of those that are hardcore believers that do not question anything and say, oh, well, my my leader, my my person I look up to is telling me it's a true case. Therefore, it must be true. But let me not look any further because this person that I'm listening to is only speaking the God's truth. So point being, taking that middle path, asking critical questions, being a skeptic, but not being a debunker, 
is so crucial, not just in this topic, but in any topic. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Yes, people might look at you like, what the heck are you saying? But you know what? It's better to have it made as clear as possible than to assume because the word assume makes an ass out of you and me. You've probably heard that a thousand times and we're going to be sharing it right here as well. So always, always ask questions, never assume. And just because someone tells you it's true or not, look it up for yourself. Use critical thinking. You got this. It's going to be awesome. But let me ask you this. What did you think about this case? I will say it's definitely in the craziest top five. Easy. I have never come across a case with this many bizarre layers to it. So it's it's up there. It's pretty high. But I do want to ask you, what did you think about this case? Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? What was your favorite aspect to it? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments as well. I do try my absolute best to read all the comments. Subscribe if you haven't already, as we do three live shows right here on this channel. And let me see if I have it. Oh, I do. Got the QR code right here. If you scan that QR code with your phone, it'll take you to all of my social media links along with my website and medium as well, where I am now writing up articles for all the shows that we do right here, along with like all of the podcast platforms, all of my video platforms as well. And it's just so easy to scan it. But if you're listening to this, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news. And also on Instagram at strange paradigms. But easier just to check out my website at strangeparadigms.com. You'll find everything that you need there and more. That is it for today. I will see you on Thursday for Mysteries with a History. It's going to be a really exciting show. You do not want to miss that one. So make sure to hit that notification bell. Oh, and while I have all of my listeners that are staying up to the very, very end, first of all, you rock. Okay. Second of all, if you need help relaxing, meditating, or using your imagination to wander the universe, take a look at my music channel called Cosmic Portals. It is space ambient music that I make. And if you need help with any of those kinds of things, or if you want to just check out music and, and see if you're into that kind of stuff, that music channel is called Cosmic Portals portals. And I know one of my amazing moderators will share that link in the live chat for you. That is it for today. I will see you on Thursday. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.